started. First off, would you guys give a green hand up? This is critical. They're on the corner of the table. Make sure you take one when you leave. Well, I cannot tell you how excited I am to see all of you here. This is awesome. My name is Caroline Danker Bissell, and I've been doing the bat chats for 18 years, courtesy of the Chautauqua Bird Tree and Garden Club. This is my last year and last chat for doing them on every single Wednesday. I may do them individually in book clubs and garden clubs, but no more weekly. I'm going to reclaim my Wednesdays. So how come we started doing these? Well, you know, at one point in time, Chautauqua had over 10,000 little brown bats. And we got research done on them from the university in Canada, York University. We had um, them come down and do bat counts. And we would uh, capture them. We would look to see if they were pregnant, because they had fat little tummies. If they were a teenager, they had little um, bones that weren't completely formed. And um, you can always tell the little boy bat from a little girl back. There is never any question which one is which. So we did that kind of research. And so the reason we started doing this is so when people came to visit Chautauqua, they wouldn't be afraid of the bats. Because you might be out at night and one might fly by very close, and you would swear that it was going to set up housekeeping in your hair, which of course is not true. But we'll talk about that later. Also, we want to educate people about bats of the United States and bats of the world. And to take home information so that on a cold winter's day, that you guys can get online and go to various sites, and they're listed on that green sheet, that will keep you busy all day learning about bats from all over the world. So I would ask you to turn your cell phones off right now, please. And hold your questions until the end because I have a lot of information to share with you. Okay, so many of you have been to my bat chats before, so you're going to know the answer to this. So if you do, let's let the newbies come up with the answer. Okay, who knows what beverage uses the bat as its logo? No, so who said that? <laughs> Bat party, I love it. A party rock. And the reason they used the bat was because back in the old days, a lot of people couldn't read and write. And so to make sure that they used the party's rum only, they put a bat on it. So nowadays you will notice the bat on the bottom. The party was started in 1862, and there's a wonderful story about that particular bat and how it ended up being on their logo. Okay, so what family the bats belong to? Mammals. And the other delineation is Chiroptera. And Chiroptera means hand wing. So take a look. Our hand and their hand. Thumb, four fingers. They have a thumb and four fingers. And depending on what kind of bat it is, if we use that thumb to climb up a tree, to hold on to a piece of fruit, to hop, skip, and jump, if it's the most infamous bat, which is vampire. vampire. They are amazing with those thumbs and scooting across the floor. So bats are just like we are. They're amazing little creatures. And you're about to find out how awesome. Okay, I'm going to dazzle you with some bat facts. Okay, ready? There are over 1,330 bats on the planet. Out of the 1,330, and that number keeps growing, 45 species are in North America. Arizona has 28 species. California has 32. And the winner is Texas, with 36 different species. Of the bats on the planet, three quarters of them are micro bats, which are the little dudes, and one quarter of them are the mega bats, which are the big honking bats. Bumblebee bats, five inches, five inch wingspan, 
and the size of an almond. Imagine how tiny that is. And bumblebee bats are found in Thailand. So chances of us ever seeing one are not too great. On the other end of the spectrum are the giant flying foxes. They have a wingspan of six feet, and they are 14 inches tall. But not to worry, they only eat fruit. So we're safe. Bats live on every single continent except one. Which one? Antarctica. You guys are so smart. How long have they been on the planet? I say that was an easy answer. 60 million years. Isn't that amazing? They've been doing really well until we came along. We're making life a little bit difficult for them. 25% of all the mammals on the planet are bats. Think about that. One quarter of all the mammals on the planet are bats. So they're really, really important little guys. Longest lifespan for a bat has been recorded at 43 to 45 years. That's a bat in captivity. Out in the wild, life is a little tougher for them. 15 to 20 years. But still, you know, for a creature that unfortunately a lot of other creatures feed on, it's kind of nice that they can make it to 20 years. The Mexican free tail bats, anybody know where those are from? The southwest, yes. Mexican free tail bats have been clocked at 60 miles an hour. They have very long wings, which is good for speed, and they fly at about 10,000 feet high. Now, they could have a tailwind, but nonetheless, they've been clocked at 60 miles an hour. The Arizona pallet bat, awesome bat, it eats scorpions and centipedes. And since we do have scorpions in Arizona where I live in the winter, we are really grateful that the pallet bats eat the scorpions. Fishing bats, amazing. They have huge feet. They can see them, you know, sneaking through the water, and they swoop down with those great big feet, and they scoop up their meal, and they hardly ever miss. Um, frog eating bats. The frog goes out at night. He's looking for his girlfriend. He's just chirping up a storm. The bats flying around up above and going, oh, I think I hear dinner. <laughs> so there becomes this little game between the bat and the frog. If the frog stops chirping, he lives to see another day. If he keeps chirping, well, that could be the last one. Tiny little woolly bats live in cobwebs. Disc wing bats, they have little suction cups on the end of their elbows, so they climb into a furled up banana leaf. They go, and their little suction cups suck right onto the side of the banana leaf, and that's where they stay until the banana leaf opens, and then they move on to the next area. Honduran tent-making bats. These little dudes right here. I love those little guys. I call them my furbies. They take a huge heliconia leaf, they nibble the spine, and when it falls down, it makes a tent. And so they're called tent-making bats. Um, in Carlsbad Caverns, New Mexico, they photographed one square foot, one square foot of Mexican free tail bats, babies. And what's a baby bat called? <laughs> a pup. Yes, baby bats are called pups. They counted 500 baby bats, you know, one square foot. That's because they like to get nice and toasty and close and secure. Okay, ladies, you ready for this one? A baby bat, also known as a pup, weighs one third of its mom's body weight when it's born. Well, cringe, cringe, right? <laughs> no! So, for the first couple of weeks, because the mom's been carrying the baby, she goes out at night to feed, she can carry the baby attached to her chest, and she can nurse the baby when she's out feeding. But when the baby gets too heavy, then she leaves it back at the roost, not nest, 
Birds nest, bats roost. Big difference. So she'll leave the baby back there and she'll come back every two or three hours and she'll nurse the baby. When bats drink, they drink on the fly. So they swoop over your swimming pool. And if you have the nerve to be out there at night swimming and a bat comes by, well, too bad for you. Because the bat owns your swimming pool and it needs a drink. When they've been sleeping all day long, they're very thirsty. So the first thing they want is a drink. Then they think about going for a meal. Bats will hover to drink nectar and pollen. And in Arizona, if you put out a hummingbird feeder and it's full at night and you come out the next morning and it's empty, guess who was there? Nectar bats. They figured out how to get an easy free meal and they didn't even have to work for it. Our little brown bats were capable of consuming 1,200 mosquito-sized bugs an hour. And that's why some of you are getting bit by mosquitoes because we don't have our little brown bats anymore. Bats can have anywhere from 20 to 38 teeth. The bug bats have real sharp teeth because they have to crunch the bugs. The fruit bats have very flat teeth because they squish the fruit between the teeth. So they're, they're designed a little differently. Insectivorous bats can consume billions of crop pests. So if a farmer has a bat colony nearby, he doesn't have to use pesticides. He's all set because those bats will take care of all those vermin that are eating his crops. Okay, so I've already given you a few hints. What do bats eat, guys? Fruit, what else? Blood, blood, somebody say blood. Yeah, bugs, okay. Blood? Frogs. Fro frogs, you were listening. What else? Fish. Nectar, pollen? Fish. Fish, good. Well, you guys are doing okay here. How about moss? We are discovering that the big brown bats that we have now that have sort of replaced the little browns are not interested in teeny tiny bugs. They're more interested in a big fat juicy moth. So even though we're getting more of the big brown bats, they don't necessarily like the little bugs. It's too much work to bother with those. Centipedes, beetles, other bats. Because remember, bats are carnivorous. <coughs> Sometimes if it's a big enough bat, it can consume a bird. Mice, lizards, crickets. So bats have learned to evolve on this planet by adjusting to whatever's available and to do it well. So, when bats go out looking for their food, they use echolocation. And the sound starts down here, it comes up the throat, goes out the mouth. And you know, often when you guys see those pictures of bats and their mouths are open and they look ferocious like they're waiting to attack you, uh-uh, they are not okay. They have to open their mouth. The sound goes out about 15 feet, bounces off whatever the bat's looking for, comes back to the tragus, which is a pinnacle, in the ear, and the bat can tell how far away the prey is, how big it is, and how fast it's moving. So they're very clever little creatures with that. Now, fruit, uh, fruit bats use smell. They have a wonderful sense of smell. They can smell a ripe fruit way up there, from zero way to none. And our most infamous bat, which is? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it has heat sensors in its nostrils and its nose, and it is able to find a place on its prey where the blood vessel is closest to the surface. And that's where it ends up feeding. So bats have adjusted to just about everything. Okay, guys, where do bats live? Caves, <laughs> okay, where else? Attics, yep. <laughs> People want to say bell tower. Now think about it. <laughs> if there's a bell tower there and it's making that noise on the hour, the bat is not going to get a lot of sleep. So if it's in a bell free without bells, probably okay. How about trees? Look at all the beautiful trees we have here in Chautauqua. And that gorgeous gnarly bark. And the bats can hide behind it and we will never see them. Um, little cracks and crevices in concrete, behind siding, um, behind your shutters that are on either side of your front door, bridges. 
guys know that they live in bridges as well. Soffits, chimneys. Most chimneys have a little space between the house and the chimney. And a bat only needs a half an inch. So he can squiggle behind there. He's protected. The chimneys are warm and toasty. And he's got the perfect place to hang out. Bat houses, boy, do we wish. <laughs> I have a gorgeous bat house at my property on the south end of the grounds. It should house 600 bats. It's, I did everything just right. The most number of bats I have ever had is seven. So life is not fair, but nonetheless, at least I've had seven. So, of all the species on the planet, here in western New York, we have none. And of the nine, five of them are tree bats, and four, no, four of them are tree bats, five of them are house bats, or the other way around. In any case, the tree bats don't hibernate. The tree bats fly down to the Carolinas. They have little deck chairs down there. They have their little models. They have their little martinis, and they spend the winter just hanging out. The house bats hibernate. So they go off to an area of about 300 and some miles, and they look for the perfect cave, or a mine shaft, or a railroad tunnel because the temperature in those places is constant, and that's what they want. So they go off in the winter, and they hibernate, but before they go, they have to put on a lot of body weight. Oh, I'd like to tell them how to do that. Um, in the fall, they start eating, and eating, and eating, and eating, and eating, and while they're eating, they're mating. And so the female bat has this wonderful thing. She holds the sperm in her body all winter long while she's hibernating. And in the spring, usually about April, and if you have a bat house, it should be up and ready to go uh, by April 1st. She comes back, and if the conditions aren't perfect, in other words, if it's not warm enough, if there aren't bugs around, if there isn't a water source, she doesn't allow herself to get pregnant. Don't you wish we had that option, ladies? Just flip a switch and go, they're no, not doing it this year. <laughs> so they come back in the spring, and once they find the perfect situation, they allow themselves to get pregnant. And as I told you, the baby back weighs one third of its mummy's uh, body weight. Okay. When you wake bats up in the winter for any reason, whether it's a caver or noise or somebody invading their space, just waking up brings their body out of a state of torpor. And as it brings all of those processes up, they can burn off three weeks of body fat just with one waking. And so what happens is when they wake in enough times, they come out in the middle of winter looking for food and they freeze to death or they starve to death. So I tell people, if you're going to go caving, don't do it in the winter, or don't do it where bats might be hibernating, because we really need all the little bats that we can have. Okay, I have handouts, um, pictures for you guys to take a look at, because I live in the dark ages, and I don't believe in PowerPoint, and so you guys are going to have to just pass these, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I hope they do, you <laughs> guys. Okay, so here you go, knock yourself up. These are local bats and local pictures. So that'll give you an idea of what some of our bats look like here. We have a bat called a quarry bat. It looks like it went to the beauty parlor and got a frost job. Gorgeous bat, beautiful thick fur. We have red bats that when they're hanging up in the fall, they look just like a leaf. They blend right in. And by the way, red bats are capable of giving birth to two. Most of the bats, the ones up here on the table, are only capable of having one pop a year. That's why it takes them so long to regenerate when there's been a problem and their colony has been decimated. Okay, so uh, let's talk about all those old wise tales you guys have heard. Tell me some of the horrific tales you've heard about bats. They carry rabies. That they all carry rabies. What else? They'll bite you. They'll bite you. They're ferocious and vicious and ready to take you on. What else? <laughs> how about they get your hair? Yeah, they you hear that one all the time. And how about the other one that you hear all the time? 
wine is a bad, right? Yeah, right. Um, how about they're chewing the wires in your attic? Uh-uh. How about that they all suck your blood? They're all after our blood. Okay, let's talk about those a minute. First off, where do bats love to hang out? As high up as they can get, because that's where they feel safe. How high do you think this is? And shrinking daily, by the way. So, no bat wants to set up housekeeping here, but the bats that I rescue are teenage bats. They're this crops, this year's crop of pups. Mom went one way, teenage bat wasn't paying attention. Now teenage bat is in your bathroom, in your kitchen, behind the dresser, under the bed, anywhere where it's not supposed to be. So those are generally the ones that I end up rescuing. So they don't want to be in your house. So if you get one in your house, we're going to talk about it in a few minutes how to deal with that. But forget the hair. But occasionally they make a mistake. And I went to the Amazon in 2001, and I lived on a riverboat for 16 days, and we trapped bats with Bat Conservation International. It was awesome. And every night we would do show and tell. And I was with Marla Tuttle, who's famous, many of you know who he is. And we would trap the bats in a mist net. He would put them in a little black mesh bag, and we would bring them down, and we would check them out. There were banana bats, there were nectar bats, and the one we captured the most were vampires. It seems like there's a huge abundance of them. Oh, you're not too smart. I'm not sure which. So one night, we had a nectar bath. And Marlon's philosophy was, if you're going to traumatize them, you should feed them. So we would mix up a tablespoon of sugar and water, and the little bat's tongue would come out. He would lap it up and lap it up. And then Marlon would release them. Well, this one particular evening, when the little bat finished all the sugar water, Merlot let it go, and it flew right past my face and landed splat right here on the gal standing next to me. Both she and the bat were shot. So occasionally bats miscalculate, but that doesn't mean they're after us. So another night, we, we trapped, trapped a banana bat, and we fed, fed it little nickel sized chunks of banana. And it kept eating and eating and eating. So we put it on the rack of bananas on the top deck, and the next morning a whole side of the banana was gone. Now this is a bat, this thing. Okay, how does it fly that much banana in it? No idea. Okay, let's talk about lying. When I go out on a rescue, I promise you that that bat sees me, and they chirp up a storm until they realize I'm not going to hurt them. So. Um, they see just fine. It's just that their echolocation system is so sophisticated that they use that when they're feeding more often than they would use their eyesight. But they see just fine. So you never tell people why is a bat anymore because it's not true. Okay, let's talk about ravens, guys, because that is serious. If you are bitten by a wild animal, and I don't care what it is, if you are bitten by a wild animal, and you can capture that animal safely, take it to your health department. They will have it tested. The rabies virus lives in the brain tissue. They have to kill the animal in order to find out if there is uh, the rabies virus in there. But if you can capture the animal and have it tested and find out that it does or doesn't have rabies, that protects you. If the animal has rabies, then you absolutely have to get the shots. No discussion. Because the, op the option is death. Rabies will kill you. So you never mess with it. So that's why I say if you can capture the animal safely, please do. Rabies is nothing to be messed with. If you're around an animal that's behaving erratically, just get away from it. Back off. Don't mess with it. Bats are not the animal that carries rabies most often. Who knows what it is? Raccoons. Raccoons, exactly. So, because bats are creatures of the night, and we're afraid of them, and we're terrified of everything that goes bump in the night, bats get a bad rap. But it's not the bats that are carrying the rabies most often. One tenth of one percent of bats have rabies. I checked with the health department last year, and I was told for last year's statistics, 45 bats were turned in, and 
only one of them ended up having rabies, and that was a bat that was found in Jamestown. So it's just something you want to be really careful about. Bats are not dirty. They groom themselves constantly, just like your cat does. And they groom each other. They don't chew wires. They're not aggressive unless you're aggressive. And all wild animals get aggressive when they're afraid. So if a bat is afraid of you, it's going to bite you, just like any wild animal would. Well, only one variety drinks blood. So you don't have to worry. Out of the 1,330-some bats on the planet, there's only three of them that drink blood. And we'll talk about those in a second. First, go to rescue procedures. So you guys will know how to do it properly. This is my bag. My high tech. My shopping is at Halloween. <laughs> and I have very high tech things in here. Real high tech, expensive stuff. Always gloves. You want to be safe with gloves, so you always wear gloves. You have a flashlight because they like to get in nice, tiny little spaces where they're protected and safe. A pencil. I'll tell you about that in a minute. Uh-huh. <laughs> a towel. And ah, I forgot to put my deli container back in there. I first thing, if a bat gets in your house, and they've been in my house three times, so I know what it feels like, and one time it was 2.30 in the morning. So first thing, if you can open the doors and the windows to the outside, do that, turn the lights down kind of low, and let the bat go out. Remember I told you about that tragus? That has little hairs on it. And it can tell when a door has been opened and there's just a little change in the airflow. And one came into my house and I guess it was about seven or eight o'clock at night, he flew past me and I went, oh boy. So I opened the doors, front doors, he made three passes and out he went. So I thought, that's very successful. And the other night, one was in my bed at 2.30 in the morning, which is really the home, I appreciate it. And I felt it, I was sound asleep. I felt the wind go by my face. I knew exactly what it was. It took me 45 minutes to capture that bat. So, the first thing is to close the doors to the rest of the house, open the doors to the room where the bat is, back off because bats flight pattern, they go up the side of the wall and down to the center of the room. Well, who's usually standing in the center going, what's happening? No, that's just what their flight pattern is. Okay, so that's your first choice. Okay, bats not going to land, bats still flying around. You have a towel. Now remember, these are little bats, guys. You don't need a beach towel. A little tiny towel will do just fine. And you can toss it up and try and capture them. And then take it out and put it on a hedgerow. Never on the ground because bats are very vulnerable on the ground. So if you can find a hedgerow, or you can just shake him out and let him get his air under his wings so he can take off, that's another option. Um, flashlight for me is to look under beds, behind picture frames, behind dressers, because believe me, they can wedge themselves into the tiniest little space. And I went out on a rescue one time at a home that had a drain pipe on the inside. And it was about a three inch drain pipe and that little stinker had wedged himself behind it. So I took the end of the pencil and I just brought it in right out and put the deli container over him. Since I, I just used my deli container on a rescue, so we'll just pretend this is a deli container. Everybody has them. And you want to use one that's clear so you can see what you're doing. No porcelain bowls, no coffee cans, no shoe boxes because you can't see what you're doing and you can injure the bat. So you take your little deli container, once he lights, you put it over top of him, and you take your cardboard and you gently slide it underneath, and then you take him out and introduce him to all your friends and neighbors, because they are really cute when you see them up close. I captured one one day, and he got so frustrated with me, there's a little air hole up here, he stuck his little foot up through here and he went to sleep. So, that's the option. You like that, right? <laughs> um, so, now those of you who've been here before know what comes next, right? Caroline's famous oath. Anybody remember that? Okay, I'm going to be watching lips, and I better see your movement. 
guys ready? I promise. I promise. Come on guys, up it a little bit. I promise never, never, ever to go after. So just because you think you came around slowly, no, 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 no. So now you know how to do it. You know what kinds of accoutrements. Everybody has a deli container in their house. Everybody has a piece of legal pad, cardboard. So there's no reason that you can't do it right. Okay, now that we got that set. Um, bad house information. For those of you who want to put up a bad house, Go to your game and fish department and ask them if there are bats in your area that will actually move into a bat house. Because there's not much point in putting one up if the bats have all died. So find out first if, if you will be successful. Because if you put that much energy into it, it doesn't happen, you're going to be disappointed. There is very detailed information out there about building bat houses. And this is what one of the books is. That House Builders Guide. And this is uh, probably about 10 years old. There are newer ones out. I'm sure there are videotapes. Bats are very specific about where they live. And this has to be very specific. So I'll give you some of the particulars. The Bat House has to face east because they want the morning sun. So east for us would be here. Here, it has to be painted black because bats want the temperatures to be 102 <coughs> degrees plus. They want it warm and cozy. It should be painted black here. In Arizona, we paint them white because we don't want to fry them. <laughs> and then they're varying colors depending on how far south you go. You have little rooms that are about three quarters of an inch. Remember I told you the bats want tight and cozy? and wonderful. No toxic paints. No screws that will rust. Um, a little vent hole in the bottom. Because on a really, really hot day, the bats will climb down lower where they get some airflow. On a cold day, they'll go all the way to the apex where the heat is, and that they will stay there to stay warm. So, bat houses are very specific. I have a lovely bat house. It should house 600 bats, and like I told you, I've had the most I've had is seven. So if you're serious about it, there are resources for you to um, go to. Bad houses only house moms and pops. The males did their thing in the fall, and they're done until the following fall. Moms and pops live in bat colonies in the bad houses. Okay, I have more pictures. Did the, pic did the pictures get to this group over here? Could you start sending them along over so these people actually get to look at them? Okay. I'll start with the other side. These are worldwide bat pictures from all over the world and the United States. So you guys get to start these and you can run them up here and then take them to the middle section. So bats all over the world have different qualities and different food needs, etc., etc. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the most infamous bat, right? You guys know that it's got a 10 foot wingspan and it's about 6 feet tall, right? <laughs> oh, come on, Hollywood told you that, don't you believe that? Okay, this is a female vampire bat. She's in a man's gloved hand. She's about 5 inches tall and has a 15 inch wingspan. That's not so much. You can see her teeth. Vampire bats I find absolutely amazing. 
They are the most agile bat. They can be on the ground. They can hop, skip, and jump. They can take off straight up in the air. Very few bats are capable of doing that. And if you notice the teeth, how sharp they are. Vampire bat's teeth, they don't bite. They slice. And it slices the top layer of the skin off. And vampires have anticoagulant in their saliva. And that anticoagulant prevents the blood from coagulating. So they can take their time drinking the blood. And they lap it up. They lick it. They don't suck. So their little tongue comes out. And they just lick up the blood. And they need two tablespoons full of blood per night. If they go 48 hours, without having protein, which is what they take in the blood, they can die. They will come back to the roost if a bat didn't go out that night, and they will feed another bat. They will also adapt, adopt pups. If a mother vampire bat is killed, they will adopt her pups. I find vampires utterly fascinating. She weighs the sum total of these five quarters. So she's not a particularly big bat. But she's got, like I told you, heat sensors in the nose. And the reason cattlemen hate them is because vampires will find, uh, there are three species of vampires, the white winged, the hairy leg, and the common. Two of them feed on birds. One of them feeds on livestock. The vampires will find a bunch of livestock, and they'll either go for the angle, and they'll just make a little slice, and they'll drink their blood, or they'll go for the haunch back here, and they will go to that same wound night after night after night. Eventually, it can get infected, and that's why ranchers and cattlemen really hate vampires. The problem is that the cattlemen will go to a cave where they think that the vampires are roosting, and they will dynamite the cave. It will take out every other species of bat that lives in that cave. So that's why education is so critical to keep from damaging and injuring other bats. I love vampires. I think they're very, very cool. But then you probably figured out I'm a little nuts anyway. So. OK, so what do you guys think is harmful to bats? Hey, oh boy, we rank right up there, don't we? Yes. What else? Yes. Cats, thank you. What else? Good one, turbines. Well, I'll talk a little more about what we're mentioning. What else? Tree removal. Humans. Yes, we're the worst. How about fear and ignorance from humans? Okay, how about snakes? There's a snake that hangs upside down and crawls back out drapes its body down, opens its mouth, and when the bat's wing grazes its mouth, it chomps down on it, and it's got an easy meal, and it hardly got the word for it. Now, in Australia, barbed wire, because we have the fruit bats in Australia, and they often get their wings caught on the barbed wires. And then the netting that they put over the fruit trees in Australia, they get their wings caught in the netting. So if you ever go along one of the Australian rescue sites, you will see how many bats suffer from that. Owls, hawks, blue jays, red-bellied woodpeckers. Okay, so let's I'm going to show you a couple of visuals here, being such a visual person as I am. And let's talk about the first thing, the white nose fungus. That has been absolutely deadly. It was brought over from Europe on a caver's clothing. They did not know they had it on their clothing, and they did not clean either their shoes or their clothing. So the fungus was introduced into Howell Caverns, which is near Albany, New York. Within a couple of years, the fungus had moved into Canada, down our eastern seaboard. This is how it eats holes in the wings. There's no bat that's able to fly with holes in its wings like that. It moved down the eastern seaboard. It's moved west into Kentucky, Tennessee, Oklahoma, 
moving further west. It's also moved into Michigan, and they just discovered it in the state of Washington. So it's relentless. It attacks the bats while they're hibernating in the winter. And because the bats hibernate nice and close, they spread it from bat to bat to bat. It's an irritant like athlete's foot. And it irritates their little skin, their little noses. They wake up. I remember how I said you burn the body fat? And pretty soon they come out in the middle of winter looking for food, and it's not there, so they die. So this white nose fungus has been absolutely deadly to the bats. We've lost over 6 million, and we're still counting. So, you mentioned wind turbines. This is in Altamont, California. It's ridge after ridge after ridge after ridge of wind turbines. Those blades can come around at 200 miles an hour. It's killing golden eagles and bats. There's also a huge one in Pennsylvania. I'm all for green energy, but when they put it in the flight path of migrating animals, that's not good. So, bat people are trying to work with the electric companies to get them to put them in a place where it's not a flight pattern of birds or bats. Okay, something else you may not have discovered. Fly paper. How many of you like to hang fly paper? Oh, I see some guilt over here. Uh-huh. Fly paper is deadly to bats. They get their little wings caught on it, and they can't release themselves and they start to die. So I used to use fly paper in Arizona in my storage unit, and I had it on the floor, and the only thing I was capturing, besides an occasional mouse, were the beautiful little pink geckos. And I got the feeling so hard and guilty, I stopped using it. So fly paper's a no-no, guys. But if perchance you were to get a critter caught on here, I've read recently that if you take mineral oil or cooking oil and you spread it over the area where the animal's body is attached, it will break down the sticky part and you can very slowly, very slowly, remove the animal's body part from the sticky part. So, but better off not to put it up at all. Okay, now we get to something somebody mentioned in the audience. And that is cats. And this is where I get up on my soapbox. If you're going to own a cat, you need to be a responsible cat owner. According to the Audubon, feral and domestic cats kill over 2 million songbirds and mammals a year. And cats, that's what they do. So it's not the cat's fault. And your cat doesn't have to roam free in order to satisfy, satisfy some natural part of its disposition. Your cat can live in the house, be a happy cat, watch the birds from out the window, and you can be a responsible cat owner. So I tell people, please don't let your cats roam loose. And should you think that I'm anti-cat, this was my girl. I had her for 18 years. She was absolutely beautiful. She never got outside, ever. So just try to remember that your cat, even though you think you're feeding it and it doesn't need food, it's in their nature. It's just what cats do. So please be responsible cat owners and don't let the cats run out. Besides which, so little all over. She lived to be 18. She was my sweetheart. Okay, so let's move on here. So I always run out of time, so anyway. Okay, what do you think the benefits of bats are? What? Fun control. Yes, what else? Pollination. Pollination, very good. Fertilizer. Fertilizer. And a plant person would think that way, wouldn't you? Watto is a wonderful fertilizer. It's got lots of nitrogen in it, which our plants love. How about crop pests, army worms, cobbling moths, cucumber beetles, all of those awful critters that destroy crops. And then the farmer puts pesticides on it. We eat it, we pay more, we get more pollution in our bodies. Not good. 
And as you said, pollination. We have gorgeous saguaros in Arizona. And the saguaro has a beautiful white blossom. And the lesser long nose bat has a little nose that's exactly the shape of that flower. And so our saguaros get pollinated at night by the bats. How many tequila drinkers in here? Ah, okay. Thank the bats next time you have something with tequila in it, because the bats pollinate the agave plants. So thanks, bats. And the vampire bats we have to thank, because the formula of the anticoagulant that's in their saliva is now being used for stroke victims to break down clots. So thank you, vampires. Um, germination. If an area is clear cut and there's nothing left, the first thing that will pollinate or terminate that area is a bat flying over or seeds falling out of its mouth or pooping, and it'll start that area all over again. The guano is also used for uh, research, using for soaps and antibiotics. So bats are absolutely incredible. And they do wonderful things for us. In places like the Solomon Islands and Guam, they eat them. And years ago, I was in uh, Laos. And I was walking through one of those markets where there are things on the ground for sale to eat. And you have no idea what to do with them or where they came from. Well, over in one section were a bunch of fried bats. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's sad. And so Jack Owen, our naturalist, said to me, Caroline, weren't you tempted to taste them? And I said, no, it would have been like eating family. <laughs> but a lot of places do eat bats, and they marinate them in coconut milk, or they um, will cook them up. But they're having issues with Chamorro Indians who are in um, Guam. The bats are feeding on what's called a cycad tree. And there are seeds called cycad trees. When the bats feed on them, it doesn't make them sick. When the people eat the bats, it's making them very sick. They're ending up with Parkinson's, Lou Gehrig's, dementia, paralysis, and death. I think I'd be giving up eating those bats if I were them. So, okay, so, wow, I am really doing a lot today. I must be talking really fast, huh? <laughs> I want to show you a picture of a, I can find it here. There he is. This is not a yellow bat. This is a little bat covered with pollen. Can you believe it? I mean, you would swear it's a yellow bat. No, it's a bat that's been hanging out in the flowers and covered itself in pollen. <laughs> So again, they are wonderful little pollinators. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, good. And then the other thing I want to tell you guys is, how many of you know that the railings at the Athenaeum are bat cutouts? Yes. Can we start to notice that? Yay! So it tells you how much we love our bats here in Chicago. You guys notice the railings? Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, you guys? Well, let me finish up and then I'll answer your question. Okay, so I have to get to the commercial part of right now. There are some books out there that if you just want a little knowledge and you know what a PhD in bat would, you can go and get a book called The Beginner's Guide to Bats or Bats of the World. It'll give you a taste, maybe all you want, and maybe just a taste will inspire you to go and learn even more about the bats. We have these in the bookstore, so you can check those out. Um, okay. There's a little book called Little Track. On your little website on that green sheet is the story of Little Track. They rescued him at Bat World Sanctuary, which is listed on that sheet. 
when little Jack was done eating, he would take his little foot up, hang it on her finger, and rock himself to sleep. And you can go on the internet and actually see him rocking himself to sleep. It is so cute. Alright, you guys, this is the serious part now. Let's see how sharp you are. Those of you who've been here before and know the answers, let's see how smart the rest of them are. Okay, guys, ready? Why did the little bat walk around in his pajamas? <laughs> he didn't have a bat robe. <laughs> oh, it gets better. <laughs> what did the little bat say when she was asked to dinner? No fangs. <laughs> Why did Junior Bat want to get a job? He was tired of just hanging around. <laughs> Where are you most likely to find bats in your house? Yeah. In the bathroom. <laughs> Come on, guys. I have a kid with me. Okay, now, it's rare when audiences get this one. So if you know it, shh. And those of you who are going to have to think a little harder, which bat hangs the highest? This is a riddle. <laughs> Which bat hangs the highest? Acrobat. You heard a gold star. Yay! Good job. What happened when the little bat swallowed the doorbell? Yes, she made it. I started coming here in 
up here. I was around bats my whole life. And when the naturalist retired in 1999, Paula Giersel, who was president of the Birdtree Garden Club at the time, asked um, Bill Mealy, should we just discontinue the bat chats? And Bill said, no, why don't you call Caroline and see if she'd be interested. I'd never done public speaking before, so I spent that winter in Arizona pouring through 30 different books, trying to synthesize everything I learned <laughs> into a one-hour lecture. Good luck with that. And started doing them in 2000. And I have loved it. I've gone to Australia to see the bats. I've seen the bats in Southeast Asia. I've uh, seen the bats in Arizona, where we did work with the Bat Conservation International, and also the Amazon. So I have a real appreciation for what they do for us, and um, I really love them. And so that I find their champion. I'm sure you all get a piece of cake. Come up and take a photograph before we cut the cake, and then come on up. <laughs>